Hello everyone, and welcome back to Trading Secrets. You know, the other day I was thinking about food. Actually, that's a lie. I think about food almost all the time. But, so this other day, I was thinking about a specific Indian dish. The dish in question? Pao Bhaji. A dish that was born out of the hustle and bustle of Mumbai's fast-paced life. A dish that is so super Maharashtrian that you would have it at every birthday party and social gathering you would attend in that state. And also a dish that is so goddamn delicious that being far away from home, I missed it and I couldn't wait to stuff it in my mouth as soon as possible. I have with me the masala mix for it, but I needed the veggies. So I hopped up on my bike and went to not the local Indian store where I would usually go to buy bindi for making bindi masala, but I could go to the local Dutch store because the ingredients are pretty standard, which is what intrigued me. For a dish that is so undeniably Indian, the ingredients are staple in Europe or even in the Americas. Why is that? First, food must be had. First one up, we have the potato. Since we gotta boil him, mash him and stick him in the stew eventually, let's start with that one. Brought over by the Portuguese from the Americas, it's the staplest of veggies in Indian cuisine. Actually, it's a staple in practically all cuisines everywhere. In Marathi, we call it batata, which was borrowed from the Portuguese, who borrowed it from the Spanish, who borrowed it from the Taino people. And in Hindi, it's called aloo. Fun etymology fact, aloo was actually a completely different root vegetable, which got displaced and replaced by the potato, but the name stuck around. The next thing to go in is the cauliflower. Known in local languages as variations of gobi, this was introduced by the British from Europe. In fact, we can trace it to a specific Brit called Dr. Jensen, who in 1822 planted the first seeds of cauliflower in Uttar Pradesh. I tried to find out why the cauliflower is called gobi, and the closest thing I could find was that gobi became the local way to say cauli? Let me know if there's something I missed here. So with these first vegetables and their etymologies, we get this. Next up, capsicum or bell pepper, specifically a green capsicum. These sweeter domesticated versions of the chili peppers were brought over by the Portuguese from South America in the late 1500s to early 1600s. I'll use the capsicum to also talk about chilies as a whole. Their first introduction in the Indian subcontinent took place in Goa, from where it spread across South India and for a few hundred years, it was only consumed down there. It wasn't until the 1800s that it became popular across the whole subcontinent. So those traditional scenes of Rajasthani women grinding red hot chili peppers isn't as ancient a practice as one would imagine. Chilies are called mirch or mirchi depending on where you are. It's a word that just means heat or something that generates heat. Even peppercorns are just miri in my mother tongue. And bell peppers were called peppers because they were hot like Indian peppers. Chilies never replaced the role of pepper though. In fact, it completely complemented the Indian palate. Also with the climate that matched their home, chilies were able to thrive in the Indian subcontinent and localized varieties were born. With these three ingredients boiling away in the cooker, let's start working on our main saucy base. For that, we start with onions and garlic. Possibly, possibly originating in Central Asia, we don't really know their exact first place of domestication. But traces of them are found everywhere between Egypt and China, dating as far back as 3500 BCE. The onion and garlic have also been heavily mentioned in Vedic texts and famously forbidden to eat if you are a follower of Jainism. So in this case, okay, we can say that onions can be considered to be of Indian origin of sorts. Dice, 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 and in it goes into a pan. Now we're on to the tomato. These also came with the Portuguese in the early 17th century. But the early ones were tiny sour berries. The big juicy kinds didn't really become popular or widely grown until the British became fans of the vegetable <coughs> fruit <coughs> until the 19th century. Tomatoes offered an umami flavor that vegetarian Indian cooking didn't have. So it was quite a nice addition to the cuisine, especially if it helped the vegetarian dishes feel fleshier compared to their meaty counterparts. 
In India, pretty much everyone calls it a tomato or a tomato, tomato or tomato. Except in Bengali, they also refer to it as a vilayati begin, meaning a foreign brinjal or aubergine. And while we can keep discussing whether it should be tomato or a tomato, I think the Aztecs would argue that it should be tomato or shitomato. Okay, let's put all of that into a pan and while it sautés away, I'll get my masala mix. Let's see what we've got here. <laughs> okay, except for the chilies, all these ingredients are Indian, or at least South and Southeast Asian. I'll get to one of these in a sec though. Let's add some salt, some chili powder, obviously this is the deadly kind. Put the rest in, mash mash, and while it simmers, let's cut up the pao. <laughs> uh, do I even need to explain this? Pao, in case you didn't already guess it, is pao, like bread in Portuguese. We didn't really have ovens in Western India before the Portuguese, and our wheat intake was always in the form of chapatis, which are super thin forms of roti. So we don't have an Indian language word for bread. Oh, and bhaji can mean either vegetable or a vegetable preparation. Lastly, we have peas. Traces of peas are found all over the Middle East and even in the Harappan civilization. So whether or not they are originally from the Indian subcontinent, which is hard to pinpoint, this legume has been around long enough to be considered native. To set up a plate, we cut up some cucumbers, which is more or less native to India, onions, I've already covered them, and coriander. Coriander was a traded commodity from the Middle East. While India shipped out pepper, cinnamon, and cumin, coriander came in and took over the cuisine, both in seed and leaf form. And yes, we do bloody love it on literally everything we cook. Deal with it. And lastly, we have a bit of lemon, which is possibly from Assam, Myanmar, or China. Hmm, <laughs> look at that. That's pao bhaji. Mm. Oh God, the, fire. the evolution of certain foods in certain areas continues to be fascinating for me. This natural human tendency to want to incorporate foreign ingredients in your local cuisines has led to some amazing inventions, from the makalu tiki to avocado and sushi rolls, kimchi with cheese on fries, and paneer peri peri pizza. Humans continue to mix and match and throw everything up in the air and see where it lands. And I, for one, am thankful for the trade and exchange that allows this to be possible. Could you let me know in the comments below if any of your favorite foods wouldn't have existed without trade? And if you like this video, also let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.